Indiana offers a preview of what's to come in Ohio. Welcome to Columbus on the Record. Indiana is a conservative state. It has a Republican governor. Republicans own super majorities in the state legislature. Nearly all of them strongly oppose abortion rights. Does that sound familiar? That's why Indiana this week provided a preview of what's to come in Ohio. The loud protests were not confined to the hallways and the demonstrators. Despite their dominance, Republicans struggled to reach consensus on a bill to ban nearly all abortions in Indiana. They disagreed on penalties, exceptions for rape and incest, and a multitude of other issues. Julie Carr Smythe, it seemed like no one was happy with the bill they were debating in Indiana. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So we have this situation uh, where uh, they are going to have to figure out this has been punted to the states and they're going to have to figure this out. And so uh, what happened was that the, um, you know, the all out ban is sort of where the debate starts, which is what the movement has wanted nationally. But then when you look at the practicality of things, getting the votes and so forth, you know, you saw, you saw that the uh, exceptions for rape and incest were a big problem. Uh, and so those were, there was a group that wanted those out of the bill, but we know the Ohio rape case here, and we um, saw that those came out at the last minute, at least in the current version. Yeah, and yeah, it, was, it was no coincidence that they were debating this, you know, two weeks, three weeks after that, that terrible case of the 10-year-old girl from Columbus going to Indiana, who had, she had been raped and, and been, became pregnant, going to Indiana for the abortion. Yeah, and you know, Governor Mike DeWine has been really careful about this too. He won't engage on questions of rape or incest or exceptions for minors or exceptions for children under the age of consent. Like he's been really careful to avoid this topic, but I actually think we may end up with a more conservative bill than what they're doing in Indiana because the Senate president here, Matt Huffman, is really clear. He doesn't see an exemption for rape or incest and he doesn't want it in his legislation. Gene, this shows the dog that's caught the car. Yes. Suddenly, Republicans who have been railing against abortion in Roe versus Wade for 40 years now have a chance to fix it in their mind, and they're, they're not unified. Um, no, and that's because um, of a variety of things. The way I've always put it is that you've got to remember there's a group I call the NPR GOP. These are Republicans who do not listen to talk radio. They watch NPR. They listen to NPR. They watch PBS. And 25% of Republicans are pro-choice. And so as they do this, they're giving them more impetus in the communities like Dublin, Upper Arlington, uh, to uh, switch over and become D's. Um, this is a, this, I look at this as a real concern overall for my party, that they're, they're going to drive a lot of people away. Morgan, does that, I mean, Indiana is still going to pass a pretty restrictive abortion ban. I think it's just that with this, on the margins, there may be exceptions for certain categories, but it's going to be, abortion will be illegal more than it is now in Indiana. But does this give activists who want abortion rights, who support abortion rights, hope that to at least influence this debate in Ohio? Well, I'm glad you said that, Mike, because we have to acknowledge that we, there already has been an extreme restriction of freedom in this country for a large percentage of the population based on where we're at in Ohio and a lot of other places. And so I do think this is going to continue to be actually a rallying cry for people to want to think about how are we going to retain our rights as Americans, our freedoms, and what's going to be the state, local, national strategy to do that. Um, you mentioned the governor. Um, DeWine, Governor Holcomb in Indiana, has also kind of played a, a sort of he's in the background. He's letting the lawmakers do their thing. Again, another similarity to how our governor operates. You, you see, you see, do you see Mike DeWine taking a back seat to this debate when it comes, likely in November? Well, I think it will likely come after the election. Um, They're talking about lame duck, which is the period after the election. So kind of between Thanksgiving and Christmas when lawmakers may take this back up. But, um, you know, notably, it's been pointed out that Mike DeWine took uh, his pro-life or pro-like stance off of his website. He removed... Uh, 
a whole section of his campaign website where it talked about uh, signing the heartbeat bill, which is the bill that currently is in place right now. He talked about being the most pro-life governor of Ohio, and all of that has kind of come off. And his folks say they were just updating the website, but um, there is some question about whether he's concerned about how this is going to play with sort of suburban voters. I guess it would not have come off before the primary, right, Gene? No. That you're absolutely correct, because he was faced with folks who were. But here's the interesting thing. If I had to define Mike DeWine, it would be his pro-life stand. He has been uh, his entire career one of the most consistently pro-life uh, politicians out there. Um, and I, I just but I have to go back to one thing that is different here is that for, you know, Senator President Matt Huffman, most of his members, they are decided by the primary. And that primary, uh, the NRA rankings have a huge impact, as does the Ohio Right to Life rankings. And that's done by a questionnaire. And the questionnaire will be, will you be supportive of ways to go ahead and put further restrictions on this? Which is one reason why I'm backing ranked choice voting. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, we, when we look at this case with the 10-year-old girl, it's really telling because the movement, as I say, has... Uh, a lot of those who were really celebrating were saying, now we can finally end abortion altogether in this country, right? Now we find um, not only uh, the sponsor of the bill in the Columbus Dispatch this week, uh, the Mike Gonadak is the head of Right to Life saying, we believe that our law would have allowed this. Now, there's a huge legal and medical yeah. battle about that, but the point being, so now they don't oppose every abortion. Um, and so how is that going to play at the Ohio State House against the people who are, have already introduced, you know, abortion ban at conception or life begins at conception? It's still really uh, about like Indiana here yeah. in Ohio. Yeah, watch the Indiana debate closely because we're going to see almost a carbon copy of it come in, in November, December when the lame duck session starts. Columbus City Council this week took an aggressive stand on abortion access. The all-democratic city council approves sending $1 million to private organizations who will help women travel out of state to get abortions. Another ordinance sends $26,000 to the group Pro-Choice Ohio to investigate so-called pregnancy crisis centers, which encourage pregnant women to forego abortion. City Council member Liz Brown calls them fake clinics. Ohio Right to Life denounced the move, saying it will put vulnerable women at, whiz, at risk and strip them of, of needed resources. Morgan Harper, this money, the million dollars, would have gone to city services. Should the city be using that money to help women who are seeking abortion travel out of state? Well, anytime there's an expenditure at any level of government, there should be discussion and dialogue with the public, with our elected officials about what that money is going towards. And I would have to assume if this is the route that city council has taken, that they believe that a lot of people in the city of Columbus are very concerned about the developments at the federal level, at the state level. And this is a right that needs to be protected. And this is now the last stop in the short term for us to be able to preserve that right for women and a lot of other people in our city. Gene, is this a good use of city tax dollars? I would say that I'm going to take a guess that about 25% of Columbus's population will take great exception to this expenditure. Um, and um, uh, I have to go back and look at, is this part of the core function of the city? Now, leaving aside the issues that you've brought up, but is it a core function of the city? You know, I don't, I, you I would know. argue providing health care, uh, access to health care for residents. Well, then, is this the really best? If you want to do health care, then I can give you some other ways you can go ahead and use the money on a more direct basis, too. Well, it's actually a great point, Jamie, because that's what makes a lot of people wonder about the disproportionate amount of attention that a lot of Republicans at our state legislature at the federal level have spent on this issue relative to all the other things and challenges that are facing our country. Does it make any sense? And the answer there is no, in my view. Uh, $26,000, not a lot of money. But it's going to pro-choice Ohio, strongly advocates for abortion rights. They're going to be the ones who investigate these pregnancy care centers. Hardly an independent investigation, I'm guessing. Right. I mean, and I can tell you right away as AP, you know, whatever they find will be very difficult for us uh, uh, to report on. Uh, because, you know, we don't use surveys that are done by interest groups that have a vested interest. So unfortunately, even if it is a completely legitimate review, um, you know, it does have that feel of, of some bias. 
As they were companies are offering support for women to travel out of state, some other city governments, Cleveland is considering it, thinks uh, Cincinnati is paying for city employees. So this is, the state's not going to do this for its employees and its residents. No, and notably the state uh, gives money to these pregnancy crisis centers. It's one of the contentious parts of the budget. They allocate several million dollars to these uh, centers. Um, and But I think, you know, it's one of those questions now about access. It's really going to come down to finances. Like, do I have the money for child care? Do I have the money to take off work? Do I have money for the hotel if I have to stay overnight? Um, you know, there's a lot of question about the legality. Even if you are early enough in pregnancy, pregnancy to take uh, an abortion pill. Um, there is a legal question about whether you can bring that pill back to Ohio and take it here or whether you must take it in the other state. Mm -hmm. And so there are a lot of costs that would go along with that. And I think for a lot of folks, that's just going, whether you have an abortion may come down to whether you have the thousand dollars to travel. Yeah. And, and it should not come down to whether or not you have the privilege to live in Columbus versus some other city in Ohio. And the way that we solve for that is by protecting the fact that abortion is health care and we need at the federal level to preserve access to abortions. Back to the pregnancy care centers, Gene. Should there be more oversight? There have been complaints that folks at these centers mislead women, don't tell them the whole story, don't give them all the options, perhaps give them, you know, medical theories that haven't been proven. Should, should the city health department be investigating these, FDA, I mean, the FDA, I guess, or state health mm -hmm. department? Well, what I would suggest is I'll play upon something that Julie just brought up, is that if we only had a major state university in Columbus that had <laughs> a um, research arm that could do an independent analysis of this whole issue, uh, that gets to your issue of you need, and I understand that, but I, what I put this down at the very beginning. This is a data-free zone. This is, this, this is a data-free zone, this whole topic. Everybody has opinions, very few people have data. But I will just add in, in term, uh, piggybacking off what you had asked before about is it a city function? I mean, governments will be having to pay for, you know, adoption, foster care, uh, health care, uh, welfare needs of various families that are impacted by these new abortion restrictions. So um, somewhere in there has to be the balance. All right. It is the final days of July and we still not have, have not seen much of J.D. Vance this summer. His Democratic U.S. Senate opponent Tim Ryan continues to run lots of ads and tour the state, but Vance continues to lie relatively low. That leaves the author and venture capitalist open to criticism from Democrats and some fellow Republicans. Gene Krebs, should Republicans be worried at the lack of visibility yes. here in late July? <laughs> yes. Are we done? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, and part of it goes to, so going back, and you know, I said this on the show many months ago when, when Tim started to put up these ads, uh, you know, at 6.58 in the morning and 6.28 in the evening, I'm going, oh, this is just stupid. Nobody puts up campaign ads this early. And I've come around going, okay, I understand this. And JD needs to match him on this to keep the game even. And right now, Ryan has defined who he is and is now about defining who JD Vance is. And it's enough, to, I think, to affect the fundraising. And he needs, to, he, needs, he needs to ditch whoever's giving him bad advice and come up with better advice. Morgan Harper, you ran against Tim Ryan in the primary. What do you think of his campaign? He's basically running, some would say even a liberal, Demo a liberal Republican rather than a moderate Democrat, a Trump Democrat. What do you think of the campaign? It's very clear that at this point, Tim Ryan is the only choice for us in Ohio to have a senator who actually has some known ability to hold elected office and actually speak on some issues. And, you know, what we're seeing from J.D. Vance is the danger of having our politics be corrupted by super PACs. J.D. Vance is not a good candidate. J.D. Vance has never been good at raising money. And the only reason he won that primary is because Peter Thiel gave him millions and millions of dollars, a billionaire who lives in California. And Trump endorsed him, which gave him a little boost, too. And that also helps. Yeah. So, so, we, so you, yeah. are you going to advocate? Are you, will Tim Ryan be able to get progressives like yourself out to vote for him if he's running ads, you know, criticizing China, you know, talking about how he's not in the pocket of any party, basically looking like almost a Trump, Trump-esque Democrat. Yeah, you know, I, I wasn't a huge fan of 
those ads referencing the power of China. It's not to the, the Chinese government, I should say. It's not that that isn't an issue that we don't need to be talking about. We do. And we need to speak about how we are going to be economically competitive in a very, very fraught global environment. But there's a way to do that and also not be racist and not use racist rhetoric. And But I will say that given how weak of a candidate J.D. Vance is and how much better of a campaign Tim Ryan is running, and where we are at as a country and some of the issues we've already discussed today, Tim Ryan's the only option. Bottom line, Anna Staver, this still is a Republican state. Donald Trump won here by six or eight points twice against Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden. Mike DeWine, heavy favorite. Just that alone is going to make Tim Ryan's fight tough. Absolutely. I think it's a case where Tim Ryan will have to do everything right. And that's sort of the question I think we're all asking right now. Is he making the right choices? And, you know, uh, J.D. Vance has said, you know, we're going to come up out with ads. We're going to tell you who Tim Ryan is. And, you know, the big question that I have is if Ryan has already set in the minds of Ohioans who he is, are those ads going to be as effective when they come in September, October? I don't know. I mean, if Tim Ryan pulls it off. I think we will all be studying how he did it for years to come. He's getting a lot of national attention, Julie. Uh, New York Times, Politico, NBC News this week wrote about this campaign. The polls are tight. This has to be helping his effort to win national money, to, to earn national money. Yes, I mean, you know, it consolidated the money when he won the primary. And uh, yeah, I think that they look at this as a, even though Trump went here by eight points twice, um, Donald Trump is a very unique candidate. Um, he's a unique Republican. And I think that, you know, you can't necessarily extrapolate his wins here to other candidates. But I also think that um, J.D. Vance, uh, can sweep in at the last minute. He proved he can, and he can advertise for a few weeks toward the end and, and get a huge surge. It's one-on-one -on -one now, Gene. Has, he, has J.D. Vance consolidated his support in the Republican Party in Ohio? Do we know that yet? I don't think we know that yet. And if I could get both gentlemen in the room at the same time, I would remind him of one very important data point. Since 1980, 88 percent of all job losses in America have occurred due to automation. Only 12 percent have been due to outsourcing. So shut up about China stealing our jobs. That's a lie. Yeah, but the voters hear that. They hear they, because politics, as according to John Abbott, is a systematic organization of our hatreds. And it's a lot easier to hate somebody in a foreign country than to hate a robot. OK. These days, little brings Ohio Democrats and Republicans together. This week, lawmakers from both parties raced to publish press releases claiming credit for or praising Congress for passing the CHIPS Act. First the Senate and then the House quickly approved $52 billion in subsidies for computer chip manufacturers to build factories here in the United States. That means nothing now stands in the way of Intel building its first two chip factories in New Albany at a cost of $20 billion and to also build the many other factories it has promised to build in New Albany. Anna Staver, we can schedule that break, that groundbreaking now. Uh, possibly. It was supposed to be July 22nd, but they canceled it. And I guess that was sort of the, the stick that they had given us because we hadn't passed the CHIPS Act yet. They decided to delay. And, you know, they had committed to these two initial plans but and $20 billion, But they've the carrot that they've been holding out for months now is if we pass the CHIPS Act, then we could have a hundred billion dollar investment and multiple plants over multiple years. And they were like, this is contingent on that. And so it's no surprise that you saw, you know, um, not a lot of Democrats, uh, sorry, not a lot of Republicans in the House came out in support of this legislation, but a large chunk of our own delegation did. Jim Jordan voted against it. The leadership asked them to vote no because of the, apparently the looming passage of, this, of the climate change spending bill. Morgan Harper, is this going to happen now? Well, it seems like it should. I mean, one of the things with any kind of corporate giveaway is it's important to know what the terms are. And transparency is the only way that we will have accountability. And I think that's an important value for us to try to seek as taxpayers in Ohio. And, you know, of course, it's good. And, and picking off of something that Gene was saying, we, we need to have a coherent industrial policy strategy. And so if Intel is a piece of that, let's go for it. But I don't know if we have had that discussion at the national level. And sometimes these negotiations become very much tied, as Anna was saying, to what a specific company wants and what they will profit off of. Julie, the state officials obviously very pleased by this. They were pushing hard. Intel and, and they played a little bit of hardball. Intel threatening to take the plants to Germany, uh, delayed the groundbreaking, as we mentioned. 
but now the burden is on them to make this happen. Right, right. And I mean, we saw the Intel CEO come out and say, you know, we're ready to break ground now. Thank you, Congress. And, um, you know, we don't really know that they weren't going to go forward. You know, they were probably working behind the scenes. But this symbolism of breaking ground and really kicking off the, um, the project is what the politicians want and need at this point. Jim Jordan voted no, following the leadership's advice. If this plant was in Marysville, he probably would have voted yes, but um, he, it won't cost him, you don't think, Gene? Uh, no, it won't cost him, but this does illustrate something. So in my conversations with the folks at two hours west of here, I've said, look, this chip manufacturing is like, it's like part of the national defense because every weapon ups, upscale from that of a firearm has chips involved in it. And we don't want to have our guns manufactured by the Chinese. We don't want to have our chips manufactured by the Chinese. To which they say, but Columbus is the one getting all the money. Mm -hmm. And so I get variations of the rich get richer and the poor get left out. And that's, and so there's a fair amount of, as this goes on longer, much to my horror, people in rural Ohio are absolutely coming to the conclusion that this is not fair. And it's the issue of not fairness that drives people to make irrational voting decisions. Well, that caused them to vote Democrat, though. <laughs> or leave, or leave, or, or skip it, or, or leave parts home. blank, yeah. or stay home. All right, our last topic, our final topic, is one we have not talked about much lately, which is kind of hard to believe, COVID. Mm -hmm. Of course, it is still with us, but we're li living to, learning to live with it. Ohio reports 30,000 new cases last week, the fourth consecutive weekly increase. About 700 Ohioans were hospitalized with COVID during the last reporting period, and 54 people died. The city of Columbus recommends people wear masks in public places. It's not a requirement, just a recommendation at this point. Anna Staver, it's, it's hard to believe we haven't talked about it, but it's yeah. there. We have colleagues, family members who have gotten COVID over the past several weeks, and masks are starting to show up a little bit more. Yeah. I've seen a couple in the grocery store and the mall. Not a lot, though. I think, um, you know, I think a lot of people um, have some mass fatigue. And if they are fully vaccinated, if they're boosted, they're probably, you know, not wanting to do it again um, without a mandate, which Columbus, Franklin County, lots of places seem real reluctant to go back that route. But we'll... I, I think it's, it's, it's really difficult. I mean, this is what we're starting to head towards year three. <laughs> <laughs> it can feel exhausting to to be thinking about it. You know, I've heard some rumblings from different schools at different school board meetings trying to think about, like, do we want to go back to this? Do we not want to go back to this? I mean, we just started taking masks off on airplanes. I don't I don't know. I feel like it's it's a really difficult place to be in. Ohio University, Julie, mandated masks starting next week. Mm -hmm. um, for Athens County, similar level to Franklin County, but they say you got to wear a mask on campus. Now, the students aren't back yet for the most part. Right. Do we see mandates coming at Ohio State, schools? I think that it will be a, it'll be a patchwork. And part of that is, you know, that our experience now, which we have a little bit, shows that these mask mandates are, you know, they're spotty in being effective. Partly that's because you're protecting other people. And if you oppose masks and you wear it under your nose or you take it off or you, or you go and you take it off when you eat, even in a mandated area, there's a lot of germs still going around. And, you know, it's really the vaccines that are the most protected. 59% of Ohioans are fully vaccinated. Yes. That means 41% are not fully vaccinated. Yes. That's about 10 points lower than the national average, Gene. Dan, that's all my neighbors and relatives, which is a phrase I use interchangeably. Uh, this ultimately <laughs> is going to hurt Mike DeWine because as we, my, my, my people back home are incensed with him over the mask mandates, the vaccines, all of that. And all this does is just rub salt on the wound as we get closer to election day. I've said before on the show, Nan Whaley wins. Mm. And I think as a result, if COVID comes back at all, it just hurts him all the more. Morgan, real quickly, should they mandate masks again, public places? I don't think it makes sense at this point, just with the variance in vaccination rate and how diligent people are when they're wearing masks. But there is a real fear out there. I've had some yeah. colleagues that have gotten sick and it's not just a little sick, you know, weeks yeah. later, still dealing with some of the after effects of symptoms. So, you know, are they hospitalized? No. But is there something short of hospitalization that starts to really impact your daily life? Yes. Yeah. And that's concerning. All right. Our off the record final 
parting shots. Gene Krebs, you're up first. Uh, on the last show I was on, I made the casual comment that um, crime is down, which made all everybody's eyebrows go up. Since 1991, a violent crime is actually off 31 uh, percent. But my, once again, my people out where I live are very worried about crime because it's been a recent uptick, but it's also they see it happening in the big cities. Morgan Hopper. We have an election day coming up. We are talking about that a little bit. I don't know if I, told, I stole Anna's, but I want to make sure everybody knows that we do have a primary, hard to believe, coming up very soon. And so hope sure hope that everyone turns out to vote. On Tuesday. Julie. Yes, I was going to say, yeah, uh, on Tuesday, I anticipate uh, at least several, maybe up to half a dozen Republican Ohio House incumbents might be picked off by um, competitors to the right, mm -hmm. uh, medical freedom type uh, competitors, people who are upset with DeWine, and, and we'll see where it goes in the fall. Hey, Anna. Well, I'm going to tell everyone that the butter cow is back because that was the <laughs> highlight of my week. Um, yeah, the Ohio State Fair, speaking of like COVID and concerns, it's been closed to the public for the last few years, and it's open and just... I'll pitch. My daughter sells Girl Scout cookies, and they're selling cookies in the Laoshi Center from 11 to 3 every day while the fair's open. Nice. All right, my off the record comment first. We got clarification on last week's discussion about the fair. If you bring a gun to the state fair, you cannot carry it on the rides. Sorry, gun toting tilt a whirl fans. Sorry. <laughs> and Columbus on the record, and our crew and I would like to thank our retiring TV content director, Brent Davis. He helped me launch this show 17 years ago. We used his old reporter's notebook for our first logo. Congratulations to Brent on a terrific career and for your wonderful service to WOSU and to Columbus. And all the best to him and his family. That is Columbus on the Record for this week. Check us out online. You can watch every episode on demand at our website, WOSU.org. For our crew and our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.